In the previous two videos, we looked at vectors and matrices and saw how they're related. Matrices are really just vectors that have dimension attributes that define their two-dimensional structure. In this video, we'll talk about two more data structures in R that have a close relationship with each other, lists and data frames. We'll turn attention to lists first and then move on to data frames since, as we'll see, data frames are actually just one special type of list. If you remember back to vectors, one characteristic they have is that all of the elements in a vector have to be of the same type. Lists can be thought of as vectors that relax this constraint. A list can store elements of different types. Let's create a list that stores four items, a short numeric vector, a long numeric vector, a character vector, and a matrix. We'll use the list function to create, to create the list and assign it the name first list. This function accepts arguments in name equals value pairs. So short in vec equals five, long in vec equals C parenthesis one comma three comma five, character vec equals C parenthesis A, B, C, all in double quotes, and mat equals matrix parenthesis one colon 12 comma in row equals four. I put each of these arguments on a separate line, but that's just for the purpose of fitting them in the screen. You can alternatively just string them together all in one line, as R is very flexible with spacing in that sense. The important thing is that each of the arguments are separated by a comma. Running the code, we see the new list object in the top right window. We can check the structure of our new list with the str function, which shows us it indeed has four elements, two that are numeric, one that is character, and the int tells us that the matrix is populated with integers. The two dimensions indicated for that fourth element indicate that it is indeed a matrix with four rows and three columns. We can also view the list and see these four items. The main aspect of working with lists that we're going to focus on for now is how to index items or pull items out of a list. There are actually a few different ways. The first will look familiar. It's the square bracket notation we used for indexing objects in previous videos. We can pull out the second element of our list with first list square bracket two. What this returns probably looks like what you might have expected, the contents of the second element of our list. However, there's something subtle about what got returned that's important when it comes to working with that piece of data. Remember that this second item in the list is a numeric vector. However, when it's indexed from a list with a square bracket notation, it gets returned as a list. Indeed, if we check its class, we see that. So, if we try to add two to each of the values, one, three, and five in that item, an error is returned. This might make a little more sense if we think about indexing more than one item from the original list. Here, I'm pulling out the second and third items, which again, are returned as a list just a shorter list than the original four item list we got them from. If we want to pull out the numeric vector itself from the second item, maybe so we can add two to each of the values, there are two ways to do it. One is with double square brackets, but before we try that, let's index it again with a single square brackets for context. Then, if we try first list followed by two in double square brackets, we see it returns the contents of that list item the numeric vector in this case, and not the list item itself. Because of that, first list with two in double square brackets plus two works as you might expect. Another option is to use the dollar sign and name of the list item immediately after the name of the list. The dollar sign is equivalent to using double square brackets and is an important notation to keep in mind for when we transition to talking about data frames shortly. We can see here that first list dollar sign long in vec gives us the same output as indexing with the double square brackets. One final point I'll make about lists relates to an associated function unlist. The unlist function allows you to turn the contents of a list back into a simple vector in a process that's sometimes referred to as flattening a list. I'll take a look at our list one more time just to remember what's in there. Again, four items that consist of a short numeric vector, a longer numeric vector, a character vector containing A, B, and C, and a matrix that stores the values 1 through 12. 
applying the unlist function to the list returns a vector that stores all of the contents of the list. More specifically, it's a named vector, and the name of each element is unique and based on that element's name in the list. Checking its class, we see it's a character vector. Remember from the video on vectors that all of the elements of a vector have to be of the same class. And because there's a mixture of numbers and letters in here, the most appropriate class R can assign this to is the character class. Understanding the basics of lists makes it fairly easy to move on to data frames, which, as I said earlier, are a type of list. Specifically, lists whose items each contain the same number of elements. Let's revisit our list one more time. We can use the length function to check the length of each of its items, and doing so, we see they have lengths of 1, 3, 3, and 12, respectively. Since the lengths are different, this list can't be turned directly into a data frame. If we try to coerce it to a data frame with the as.data.frame function, we get an error that says different numbers of rows are implied. Notice though that two of the four items, the second and third items in the list, do have the same length, three. This means we should be able to pull, pull out those two specific items and use them to create a data frame. If we try the same as.data.frame function on those two, we get a data frame return that has three rows and two columns. This might be a good time to think about the important properties of data frames. First, data frames are similar to matrices in that they have two dimensions, and so they're arranged into rows and columns. Like I mentioned in the previous video on matrices, in this regard, you can think of both matrices and data frames as analogous to a sheet in Microsoft Excel or a similar spreadsheet program you might be familiar with. An important difference in matrices and data frames, though, is that a given matrix can only store one type or class of data, while data frames relax that constraint. The different columns of a data frame can store different types of data. These characteristics highlight the relationships of matrices and data frames with their underlying data structures. Matrices have a close relationship with vectors, as both can store only one type of data, while data frames have a close relationship with lists, and both of these can hold multiple types of data. Let's practice with some data frames now. We'll use the data.frame function to create a new data frame called df. The syntax for the arguments here is the same key equals value pair format that we used when we created a list earlier. In this case, we're creating a data frame with three columns. These would be equivalent to three items in a list if we were to replace the data.frame function with the list function. Again though, an important characteristic of these three items is that they're all the same length. Each has length four. This means the data frame will have four rows. Once created, we see it listed in the top right window. And since this one is pretty small, we can easily view it in the R window. Checking the structure of the data frame, we see it has three variables or columns. Two are numeric and the third is listed as a factor. We haven't talked about factors yet. This is a class of data in R that is primarily for categorical variables, and we'll look at factors in a future video. The data frame function has an argument named strings as factors that by default is set to true. So any columns that contain data that look like what you might normally think of as character data will be converted by the data frame function to factors. For now, let's recreate our data frame and turn that behavior off. I've done that here by adding the strings as factors argument and setting it to false. Now that third column is of class character like you might have originally expected. When it comes to indexing items from a data frame, we can use a combination of methods that we've used for matrices and for lists. For example, similar to a matrix, since the data frame has two dimensions, one way to index it is by providing both dimensions inside single square brackets. Remember that in R, rows always come before columns. So, df square bracket 2 comma 3 gives us green, and df square bracket 4 comma c parenthesis 2 comma 3 gives us the section of the data frame corresponding to the cells in columns 2 and 3 of row 4. Like with matrices, if we leave one of the dimensions blank, we get everything returned for that dimension. So, 
df square bracket two comma gives us the entire second row, while df square bracket comma three gives us our color column. While the square brackets are a common way to index data frames, remember too though that data frames are basically just special cases of lists, and so the same notation we use to index lists also applies to data frames. We looked at three ways to index a list, with single square brackets, double square brackets, and the dollar sign. While all three of these can be applied to data frames, the dollar sign notation is what you'll encounter and probably use most often. DF dollar sign odds gives us the contents of the first column, and we can get the second column, named evens, in the same way. Note here that when I type the dollar sign, R recognizes that a column name will come next and gives me options to choose from. This autofill behavior is a nice convenience in our studio and is also available in other situations beyond choosing column names from a data frame. Get used to taking advantage of this as often as possible as it will save you keystrokes, reduce typos, and increase your efficiency in R. I select evens from the list and get the values from column two. Two more items about data frames before we wrap up with this video. All of the rows and columns in a data frame will be named. Even if you don't explicitly name them, default values will be assigned. Let's take one more look at our data frame. Remember that this data frame has three columns, which are also sometimes referred to as variables. We define these three, odds, evens, and color, when we originally constructed the data frame. Notice here, though, that there are actually four columns of data printed to the screen. The first represents the row names, which since they haven't been defined otherwise, have just been given default values one through four. The row names function returns the row names of the data frame, and it can also be used to assign new row names. Here, I'm assigning new row names A through E. Viewing the data frame again, we see these new row names. The call names function works in a similar way for column names. However, the names function is equivalent and is what you'll probably use more often. For example, I can change the name of the third column in the data frame from color to colors by assigning colors to names parenthesis df square bracket three and can again see this change by viewing the data frame or alternatively by using the names function to view the names. It's important to get comfortable working with data frames and by extension lists as you'll likely work with data frames in nearly every one of your R sessions. At this point We've looked at some of the fundamental data structures that you'll encounter, vectors, matrices, lists, and data frames. While we'll address others as we go forward, being comfortable with these four data structures will go a long way in helping you be productive working in R.